My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a Hollywood film and television editor, a documentary director, father of two, an American ninja warrior in training, and the creator of Optimize Yourself. For over 10 years now, I have obsessively searched for every possible way to optimize my own creative and athletic performance, and now I'm here to shorten your learning curve. Whether you're a creative professional who edits, writes, or directs, you're an entrepreneur, or even if you're a weekend warrior, I strongly believe that you can be successful without sacrificing your health or your sanity in the process. You ready? Let's design the optimized version of you. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Optimize Yourself podcast. Whether you're brand new to the show or you're a seasoned vet, it would mean the world to me if you took just one minute to share this episode with a friend or a colleague who could benefit from what you learned today. And don't forget to also click the subscribe button in your podcast app of choice, because the more subscribers we have, the more that iTunes and the other platforms recognize this show, and thus the more people that you and I can inspire to step outside their comfort zones to reach their greatest potential. And now on to today's episode which is a special episode where I provide my articles in audio form so you have the opportunity to walk and listen instead of sit and read if that's your preference. My hope is that you're gonna use this opportunity to get up, step outside, move away from your quarantined office for the next 25 minutes and build the habit of moving more throughout your workday, whether at home or otherwise. The following is a reading of my article titled Fear. How to Protect Your Mental Health from the Infection Far Worse Than COVID-19, which can be found at optimizeyourself.me slash COVID-19. And for anybody living under a rock that doesn't know how to spell COVID, it is C-O-V-I-D-1-9 with no dashes in the URL. This episode is made possible for you by, you guessed it, Ergo Driven, the creators of the Topo Mat, my number one recommended product if you are interested in moving more and not having sore feet at your height adjustable or standing workstation. Almost every new person that I meet in this industry starts our conversation with, hey, I got a Topo Mat because of you. It changed my life. Thank you. If you are not standing on one today, I cannot recommend it enough. It's super comfortable. It's an awesome conversation starter. And by the way, it's also scientifically proven to help you move more throughout your workday. To learn more and get your topo mat, visit optimizeyourself.me slash topo. That's T-O-P-O. Seriously, how the hell did we get here so quickly? Not even a week ago, we were posting memes making fun of silly handshakes from the future and about replacing our toilet paper with the three seashells. And now we have no NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, NCAA March Madness, South by Southwest, NAB, Disneyland, Universal Studios, school of any kind, or, well, anything. And don't even get me started on my first thoughts upon hearing that Sheriff Woody was infected with the coronavirus. Aside from the impact of canceling essentially every public gathering and sporting event worldwide, Hollywood and the entertainment industry are getting obliterated. Over 90 Hollywood productions have shut down so far as of publishing this article, and no doubt this number is going to become obsolete within hours, and my apologies for that in advance. Now, this doesn't mean that your favorite binge-worthy shows are delayed. This means that tens of thousands of people are instantly out of work with no corporations that are willing to cover their salaries because they are independent contractors or weekly employees, as opposed to staff employees that would have benefits. Even worse, the lack of work over a long enough period of time could potentially lead to the loss of health benefits at the worst possible time. To put it simply, we are in uncharted waters, and everyone is terrified of the unknown. So what's different about COVID-19? While the global response to COVID-19 is absolutely unprecedented, what I find more interesting is that the circumstances that got us here are far from unprecedented. You've no doubt seen comparisons between the coronavirus and the Spanish flu or other similar strains of this virus like SARS or H1N1, which is also known as the swine flu. So why didn't these global pandemics cause mass closures of all public gatherings, educational institutions, widespread hysteria, mass travel restrictions, xenophobia, foot handshakes, toilet paper shortages, don't even get me started on those, and our stock market to collapse in a mere matter of days? 
Comparing present circumstances to the Spanish flu is practically impossible, given that 100 years ago, we didn't yet have air travel, cell phones, or the internet, not to mention the radical advances in medicine over the past century. My God, in 1918, horses were still a common source of transportation. Comparing present circumstances to the swine flu, however, is where things get really interesting. In 2009, we did have international air travel. We had cable, satellite, and broadcast television. We had CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. We had the internet, and we even had cell phones. If you were to ask almost anyone about their memories of the swine flu epidemic from just 11 years ago, they'd probably respond with, yeah, I, I guess I remember that. Did you know that the swine flu was also declared a global pandemic and that the stock market actually rose 10% within one month of it being declared a public health emergency? Did you know that an estimated 22 million people were infected with H1N1 in 2009, and this led to anywhere between a projected 151,700 and 575,400 deaths, and this is as of 2012? I'll bet you didn't know any of this. So how did we get here so quickly then? Because in 2009, our screens and our devices had yet to become extensions of our brains. Yes, I fear the coronavirus. Not for me personally or for my immediate family. We're all healthy and the mathematical probabilities overwhelmingly suggest that if we're infected, well, we're just gonna kind of feel like crap for a few days and then we'll move on with our lives but I do fear for the most susceptible to this virus, which include many members of my extended family, including my parents, which is why I am happy to practice social distancing to prevent the spread of infection to those whose lives depend on our discretion. However, there is an infection that I fear far worse than the coronavirus, and that is the infection of fear. When last we dealt with a global pandemic as serious as COVID-19, we weren't yet addicted to our dumb phones. Yes, we had Facebook and Twitter in 2009, but they were still in their infancy and far from the mass communication juggernauts that they have become today. Facebook only had 150 million users at the time, as opposed to 2.37 billion today, and we used it to share pictures of our kids holding hands on playdates and cyberstalking our college crushes. Twitter only had 58 million users, as opposed to 337 million today, And we use Twitter to watch appointment television shows like American Idol, House, and 24 as a national community. And apps, well, those were cool toys, but they were not indispensable tools that ran our lives. Fake news wasn't a thing yet. And in 2009, there were only an estimated 172 smartphone sales, which pales in comparison to the more than 3.5 billion people who use smartphones in 2020. We haven't reached the point of global mass hysteria and economic collapse because of an incurable virus that no human has immunity from. We got here because the world that we are reacting to is the one that we see devolving before us moment by moment on our screens. As the tagline from the 2011 film Contagion exhibits, nothing spreads like fear. Fear is the infection that you can control. Listen, I am just as guilty as everyone else. I have spent hours during this crisis absolutely frozen, blindly staring at my phone, mindlessly scrolling through Twitter, Facebook, and various news sites with my jaw dropped, whispering, what in the holy f*** is going on right now? I've seen the pictures of the barren streets in Italy, the empty shelves with no hand soap, paper towels, or drying canned goods, and the endless charts and statistics about the possible spread of the virus, the predicted infection rates, potential deaths, etc., etc., etc. But I've also looked out the window to see my neighbors walking their dogs. I've been to the grocery store to see that there's still plenty of food for everyone, even if it does mean impatiently waiting in lines wrapped around multiple aisles. I've been to the ATM machine, and I've easily been able to withdraw the maximum daily amount without getting alert messages that all the money in the world is gone. For the vast majority of us in the first world, we still have water to drink, electricity to power our lights and devices, gas to heat our homes and cook our meals, food to eat, and air to breathe. If you have access to the internet and you're listening to me right now, and you still receive Amazon Prime deliveries, let's admit it, things could be a lot worse. 
I'm not saying that this is cause to not take any precautions or to ignore this pandemic and ignore those who are in serious danger, specifically the homeless, the elderly, or those with diseases that make them more susceptible to serious complications. At this point, we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that this virus exists. It's dangerous, and we all need to do our part to contain the spread so it infects the least amount of people possible, no matter how inconvenient. We also know that although this virus is largely out of our control, we can take back some control by making a habit of washing our hands more often, doing the corona handshake with our elbows and our feet, staying away from large gatherings, which frankly at this point is easy because there aren't any left, being more conscious of the surfaces that we come in contact with and touching our faces less. By the way, good luck with that. Beyond this knowledge, how much additional value are you really getting from staying glued to your Facebook, Twitter, or endless news feeds for hours a day? Are things really going to change minute by minute such that you need to read every single breaking news story? Is staying connected to current events serving you and is it serving your family? If we were talking about a wildfire or a natural disaster, minute-by-minute Twitter updates could literally save your life. But in this scenario, I can think of far better things for your mental health than staring at your phone. Now, if you find yourself losing control and getting sucked into the black hole of anxiety and paranoia, here are five simple suggestions as well as a bonus to help you weather the storm and begin taking back control of your mental health during this unprecedented global crisis. Number one, over-prepare. One of the most valuable lessons that I've learned from two plus years of training for American Ninja Warrior is how to manage and minimize fear. And the greatest advice that I've received is from a former Cirque du Soleil trapeze artist. As someone who has swung through the air and defied gravity for two decades, he told me that their method for overcoming anxiety and fear is to mentally visualize every possible worst case scenario. If you fall, what happens? Well, there's a safety net. Yeah, but what if the safety net fails? Then what happens? Well, there's a second safety measure. And if that backup safety net also fails, what's next? Well, there's going to be a team there to catch you. After visualizing all scenarios and practicing failing as much as practicing success, the brain recalibrates its response to fear. As someone who was terrified of heights two years ago and had a panic attack just 15 feet up a bouldering wall, I can now belay 60 feet off the ground without breaking a sweat because I have practiced falling over and over and over. And this level of over-preparation has provided me with an almost absolute certainty that, well, I'm gonna be fine. As human beings, we all crave certainty and we are terrified of the unknown. Right now, we don't know if this pandemic is gonna last for a week, a few weeks, or six months. And while we can't control what may happen next, we can control our level of preparedness. No, I'm not suggesting that you ruin it for the rest of us by stocking up on six months worth of paper towels, toilet paper, and hand sanitizer. All the idiots have covered that already. But in situations like this, you have some control over the anxiety about not being prepared. Make the trip to the store, brave the longer lines, and buy more food than you think you'll need for the next couple of weeks. Personally, I've been buying two weeks of supplies every week to slowly but responsibly stock up have plenty of medication on hand. Hey, buy some decks of cards or board games if you're concerned about how to keep your kids away from screens for the next several weeks. Spend more money than you think you should, if you can, of course. Give yourself multiple safety nets. The worst case scenario, if you over-prepare, is spending a few hundred dollars on food or supplies that you might eventually throw away. The worst case scenario, if you are under-prepared and things get worse, well, that could be unimaginable. Easy choice. Number two, reprioritize your finances. The next thing that you can control to alleviate anxiety about the uncertain future is your finances. If we're being honest, I'm guessing you're probably more worried about your bank accounts than starvation or infection, right? First things first, stop following the stock market. If your investing strategy is focused on timing the short-term market, then you need a new strategy. But seriously, get off your phone. Instead of leaning into the fear, use your time more productively to plan your financial safety net. I find that most people have a general budget or a vague idea of how much money they need every month, but hardly anyone has defined what I call their sleep easy number. 
This is the exact amount to the dollar that you require in your main bank account to cover every single basic expense, fixed or variable, to maintain your current lifestyle on a monthly basis. This is all the basic necessities to have a roof, electricity, heat, food, water, transportation, insurance, security, etc. Once you know this number, it's easier to plan for three to six months of emergency savings, it's easier to plan for the next hiatus, And it's easier to understand how much of your excessive lifestyle you must trim during times of crisis. If you don't have an emergency fund to provide a minimum three-month safety net for times like this, right now is a pretty good time to start building one. Once you have a clearer picture of your sleep easy number, it's time to eliminate some of the non-essential expenses that instantly reveal themselves as trivial once the word global pandemic hits your Facebook feed. Especially if you've just lost your job for the foreseeable future, I bet multiple items on your monthly budget, they can go pretty quickly under the circumstances, no? Use the next several weeks at home to start building your long-term safety nets so this fear never wins again. My favorite resource for financial planning is Ramit Sethi's I Will Teach You To Be Rich, which you can find at IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com. Number three. Disconnect from every anxiety-inducing app and website, or at the very least, start sharing more responsibly. With supplies on hand and a better picture of what it's going to take to survive this crisis financially, the next step is to disconnect from the matrix immediately. If you are in agreement that you need to disconnect, but your plan is to, well, just stop using your phone, good luck with that. The dopamine hits that you've received from the slot machine that is social media and breaking news are going to make this habit very hard to break. Not to mention the massive overdose of information, fear, and hysteria that has been injected straight into your amygdala during this crisis. My top recommendation is to install the Freedom app, which you can find at freedom.to, to block all offending apps across all of your devices. It's highly customizable to block any site or app for whatever time period works best for you. I personally have blocked everything for 24 hours a day at this point. If things change for the worse, I'm sure I'm going to hear about it from my wife or other family members. But if you are not comfortable with a 24-7 cold turkey digital detox, at least prioritize specific times where you can disconnect and be more present with your friends or your family. And by the way, help them disconnect as well. And if you want to go even deeper down the rabbit hole, you can learn how to become a digital minimalist from best-selling author and social media expert and genius, Cal Newport. And to listen to our episode about becoming a digital minimalist, you can go to optimizeyourself.me slash episode 65. Once you've disconnected yourself as it suits you, start changing what you do share with an increased awareness of your responsibility to not induce unnecessary panic. Stop staring at the pictures of empty shelves on Facebook thinking that you and your family are going to starve. More importantly, stop posting your own pictures of empty shelves. You are not helping. Instead, start sharing pictures of the food that is available right now. Share pictures or stories of the activities that you and your family are doing at home to reconnect. And stop posting any fear-inducing stories or charts that are not meant to educate and inform. Practice social distancing in public. Practice social connection online. Number four, prioritize sleep and exercise, especially cardio. I know how tempting it is to cuddle up with Netflix and a pint of mint chocolate chip and binge every single show that you've had in your queue for the last six months, but the game has changed. We are now literally talking about life and death. Your well-being and safety are the priority. The last thing that you want to do is weaken your immune system by being sedentary for the next few weeks or spending late nights in front of the television, sacrificing hours of sleep in lieu of watching just one more episode. Moreover, the more that you embrace the fear and anxiety of current events, and the more you couple that with lack of exercise, the more prone you're going to be to depression, which is a vicious cycle that leads beyond anxiety into outright paranoia if you're not careful. By the way, I've been there firsthand. It is not pretty. Now is the time to begin the habit of moving more during the day, taking walks around the block, going hiking, getting on your bike, or whatever inspires you. Remember all those times when you were locked inside a dark windowless room thinking, oh my God, I cannot wait until the next hiatus so I can finally get healthy. Now is the perfect time. It's not like the air is infected with Ebola. You can still go outside. 
More importantly, specifically because COVID-19 is a pulmonary infection and it primarily affects the lungs, when you do cardio-specific exercises, for example, jogging, biking, rowing, plyometrics, HIIT training, etc., it forces oxygenated blood into the lower lungs to lessen your vulnerability and build healthier lungs in general. So given that you might feel less than comfortable with going to the gym right now, right there with you, my work at home routines of choice are Tony Horton's Next Level program, which is on Amazon Prime, or you can also access a multitude of awesome work at home routines via Beachbody On Demand. And my obvious recommendation is any program from P90X creator Tony Horton. Yesterday was the best time to start an exercise routine, but now a lot more is at stake, so the next best time is now. And as a bonus, there's no doubt that like me, your diet and eating habits have completely gone to shit. The least you can do is give your immune system a boost by getting a minimum of your daily serving of greens in one glass. My favorite product for doing so is Athletic Greens, and you can learn more at optimizeyourself.me slash greens. Number five, build your professional network from home. So far, I have intentionally avoided the elephant in the room to focus on more critical necessities such as food, water, money, and your sanity. But assuming that we've got all of the following relatively under control, the obvious next challenge is, what am I supposed to do about work? As a lifelong introvert, I can say that I have been practicing social distancing as a professional art form my entire life. If it were a professional sport, I would be at the Olympic level. Because of that, I built my entire professional network from home in my pajamas. I have no intention of allowing the coronavirus to put a crimp in my networking plans. I realize for many of you, the loss of in-person panels, workshops, networking events, festivals, and meetups severely inhibits your ability to connect with people and find the next gig. But the good news is that everyone else is in the exact same position as you. They are stuck at home with the internet and nothing but time. There is no better opportunity than right now to begin researching and connecting with people who can potentially open the right doors to the next stage in your career. It's still gonna be there. And if you were worried that people are too busy to do a quick phone chat, well, guess what? Not anymore. There is no better time to get yourself into other people's inboxes and build your professional network. Yes, if you approach your outreach with a transactional approach and the intent of just finding work, you're wasting your time. And I would argue that this approach never works, global pandemic or otherwise. But if you approach networking as a way to build genuine relationships with people in your industry that you admire, you finally have the time to focus on doing it right without the pressure of needing work immediately because frankly, there's not gonna be any work for a while anyways. And if you are unsure where to get started with email outreach, visit optimizeyourself.me slash email guide for my insider's guide to writing great outreach emails. And as a bonus, set yourself up to work remotely. If you have just been laid off because your project has gone on an indefinite hiatus, you can choose to accept your circumstances or you can use this time to set yourself up to provide your services remotely if you can't do so already. Using my email outreach guide, you now have the power to extend your network beyond your current circle of collaborators. Now you can focus on investing for what will soon become our inevitable future of working remotely on a global scale. Get educated. Download some trial software for remote collaboration tools like Zoom or Frame.io. Research what it would cost to invest in additional media storage or conversely working from the cloud and build the workstation that will allow you to become a globally available talent as opposed to just local. You are in more control than you realize. We are all in uncharted waters dealing with unprecedented circumstances on a global level. I have no more certainty than you about how everything is going to work out. While there are a few things within our control right now and Frankly, it feels like nothing is. There are things that we can control to avoid the pandemic of fear and protect our mental health and well being. We can over prepare for the worst and hope for the best. We can clarify our financial needs and what we can sacrifice. We can disconnect from the endless 24 cycle of fear and paranoia. We can prioritize sleep, exercise, and our sanity. We can focus on expanding our network from the comfort of our home, no less, and we can invest in the global transition to remote work. 
And finally, be grateful for what you do have access to in our modern world. It wasn't until I saw empty store shelves plastered across social media that the thought of not having access to food and water became a potential reality. I can't tell you how amazing it felt to bag my own groceries thinking, oh my God, I am so lucky to have access to healthy food, fresh produce, and an abundance of staple foods 10 minutes from my house. Things could be much worse. And P.S., it's okay to curl up on the couch with the ones you love, your Netflix queue, a handful of spoons, and a shared pint of mint chocolate chip ice cream while everybody says, F it all. Thank you so much for listening of the reading of my article, Fear, How to Protect Your Mental Health from the Infection Far Worse Than COVID-19, which can be found at optimizeyourself.me slash COVID-19. Thank you for listening, be safe, stay healthy, and be well. This episode was made possible for you by, you guessed it, ErgoDriven, the creators of the Topomat, my number one recommended product if you are interested in moving more and not having sore feet at your height adjustable or standing workstation. Almost every new person that I meet in this industry starts our conversation with, hey, I got a topo mat because of you. It's changed my life. Thank you. Listen, standing desks are only great if you're actually standing well. Otherwise, you are just fighting fatigue and chronic pain. Not like any other anti-fatigue mat, the topo is scientifically proven to help you move more throughout your day, which helps reduce discomfort and also increases your focus and your productivity. I'm literally standing on one as I read this, and I don't go to a single job without it. And if you're smaller and concerned the topo mat might be too big, or you simply don't have the floor space, well, there's a topo mini for that. To learn more, visit optimizeyourself.me topo. That's T-O-P-O.